Did you know that your body has its own version of a sewer system? A good system of handling excess water and debris is an important part of any community. It helps take away contaminated substances that might cause harm, but most of the time we barely notice this system, unless it started to fail. Our body has a similar system that deals with excess water and contaminated substances too. There are millions of tiny vessels in our body that job is to gather excess water, proteins, cells, and spits of debris, which is what we call the lymphatic system. Have you ever been bitten by a mosquito? Sometimes we won't even know if we were bitten by a mosquito, not until when we see a very mild and tiny red lump in our skin along with some itchiness. But don't worry, that bump is an important signal that means we are protected by our immune system. Our body's major safeguard against infections, illness, and diseases. This system is a vast network of cells, tissues, or organ that coordinate our body's defenses against any threats to our health. Without it, we'll be exposed to billions of bacteria, viruses, and toxins. Hi everyone, I'm Cassin Jerome Vincent R, and I am one of the reporters in this video and a member of this team, which if you haven't noticed yet, is the lymphatic and immune system. In this video, there are a total of six different topics but is connected from one another. And those topics will be discussed by every member of this team. So without further ado, let's start. The lymphatic and immune system. Before we have Mom Sarah Reyes to discuss as the three main functions of the lymphatic system, let me give you first an introduction about our lesson by giving you its general definition. Okay, the lymphatic system is the system of vessels, cells, and organs that carries excess fluids to the bloodstream and filters pathogens from the blood. The lymphatic system plays a key role in the immune system, fluid balance, and absorption of fats and fat-soluble nutrients. While the immune system is the complex collection of cells and organs that destroys or neutralizes pathogens that would otherwise cause disease or death. If the immune system is not able to fight off these microorganisms or pathogens, they can be harmful and even fatal. The lymphatic system for most people is associated with the immune system to such a degree that the two systems are virtually indistinguishable. Good day, I'm Sarah C. Reyes from DSED1. D and I'm going to discuss the three main vital functions of the lymphatic system, their role and the vital functions in our body. The fluid, fluid balance the lymphatic system maintains the balance of fluid between the blood and tissues known as fluid hemostasis. It drains excess fluids and proteins from tissue all around the body and return them back into the bloodstreams. Fluid balance is also known as the fluid hemostasis, which controls the amount of the water inside our body. The main functions of lymphatic system is to drain excess body fluids in our body and proteins from tissue and return back them into the bloodstream. In human body, 20 liters produce in interstitial spaces from tissue each day due to filtration. Interstitial spaces is spaces between the individual cells it refers as the interstitial fluids. The 17 liters of the fluids is absorbed directly. The remaining 2 to 3 liters is returned by lymphatic system includes protein that too large to be transported in blood vessels. Absorption, the lymphatic system facilitate absorption of fats and fat soluble nutrients or vitamins in the digestive system and transport this into the blood streams. Absorption the, absorption, the lymphatic system facilitates absorptions of fats and fat-soluble nutrients or vitamins in the digestive system and transforms this into the bloodstreams. 
Lymphatic system it is responsible for facilitating the absorption of fats and soluble fats or vitamins in the digestive system from foods. Most of the fats are commonly absorbed in gastrointestinal tract by the lactils. Lactils is the absorptive surface. Lactils is absorbed fats and soluble fats or vitamins that forms a, a white milky fluid that called chyle. Chyle is contain the lean and emulsified fats and free fatty acids and deliver nutrient. Defend the body, the lymphatic system from part of the body's immune systems and help the pains against bacteria and other intruders. As the vertebrate immune system evolves, the network of lymphatic system became convenient avenues for transporting the cells of the immune systems. Additionally, the transport of dietary lipids and fat soluble vitamins absorbed in the gut uses this system too. The lymphatic systems defend the body by producing immune systems against bacterial and other intruders and in any diseases. The vertebrate immune system is the, mo is the most convenient avenue to transform immune cells, dietary, dietary lipids, and fat soluble vitamins that absorb in this system too. Cells of immune system is not only use lymphatic vessels to transform in interstitial space, but also use lymph nodes for the development of the critical immune response. The lymphatic system, the lymphatic system keeps us alive. The lymphatic system keeps the bodily fluid levels in balance and defends the body against infections that made up of complex networks that carry limbs and other substances throughout the body. Good day everyone, I'm Noreen Elparumog and now we were going to talk about the structures of the lymphatic system. Lymph or lymphatic fluid. Lymph also called lymphatic fluid and it is a collection of the extra fluid that drains from cells and tissues that is not reabsorbed into the capillaries plus other substances. The other substances include proteins, minerals, fats, nutrients, damaged cells, cancer cells, and other foreign invaders like, like bacteria and viruses. Lymph also called transports infection-fighting white blood cells or what we call lymphocytes. These are the lymphatic vessels, the parts of lymphatic vessels, the valve open, overlapping endothelial cells, valve closed, direction of lymph flow, and the fluid entering lymphatic capillary. Lymphatic vessels are the network of capillaries and large network of tubes located throughout the body that transport lymph away from tissues. Lymphatic vessels collect and filter lymph as it continues to move toward larger vessels called collecting ducts. These vessels operate very much like your veins do. They, they work under very low pressure, have a series of valves in them to keep the fluid moving in one direction. The lymphatic system collects excess fluid that drains from the cells and tissue throughout the body and returns it to the bloodstream, which is then recirculated through the body. Next is the lymphatic vessels. The lymphatic vessels begin as an open-ended capillaries, which feed into larger and larger lymphatic vessels and eventually empty into the bloodstream by a series of ducts. Along the way, the lymph travels through the lymph nodes, which are commonly found near the groin, armpits, neck, chest, and abdomen. Lymphatic vessels in the arms and legs convey lymph to the larger lymphatic vessels in torso. The lymphatic vessels or lymph vessels or lymphatics are thin-walled vessels, structured like blood vessels that carry lymph. As part of the lymphatic system, lymph vessels are complementary to the cardiovascular system. Lymph vessels that carry lymph to a lymph node are called afferent. Lymph vessels and those that carry it from a lymph node are called afferent lymph vessels. 
from where the nymph may travel to another nymph node may be returned to a vein or may travel to a larger lymph duct. Lymph ducts drain the lymph into one of the subclavian veins and thus return into the general circulation. Next is the lymphatic capillaries. Lymphatic capillaries, also called the terminal lymphatics, are vessels with uh, interstitial fluid enters the lymphatic system to become lymph fluid. Located in almost every tissue in the body, these vessels are interlaced among the anterioles and venules of the circulatory system in the soft connected tissue of the body. Lymphatic capillaries are formed by one cell thick layer of endothelial cells and represent the open of the system, allowing interstitial fluid to flow in them via overlapping cells. Lymph Capillaries or lymphatic capillaries are tiny thin walled microvessels located in the spaces between cells except in the central nervous system and non-vascular tissues, which serve to drain and process extracellular fluid. Upon entering the lumen of a lymphatic capillary, the collected fluid is known as lymph. Each lymphatic capillary carries lymph into a lymphatic vessel, which in turn connects to a lymph node. A small vein-shaped gland that filters and monitors the lymphatic fluid for infections. Lymph is ultimately returned to the venous circulation. Lymphatic capillaries are slightly larger in a diameter than blood capillaries and have close ends, unlike the loop structure of blood capillaries. Their unique structure permits interstitial fluid to flow into them into them but not out. Lymph capillaries have a greater internal pressure than blood capillaries due to the greater concentration of plasma proteins in the limb. So now we're here in the last structure of the lymphatic system. The larger lymphatic vessels, trunks, right lymphatic, and thoracic duct. The lymphatic capillaries empty into larger lymphatic vessels which are similar to veins in terms of their three tunic structure and the presence of the valves. These one-way valves are located fairly close to one another and each one causes a bulge in the lymphatic vessel giving the vessels a beaded appearance. The superficial and deep lymphatics eventually merge to form larger lymphatic vessels known as lymphatic trunks. On the right side of the body, the right sides of the head, thorax, and the right upper limb drain lymph fluid into the right subclavian vein via the right lymphatic duct. On the left side of the body, the remaining portions of the body drain into the larger thoracic duct, which drains into the left subclavian vein. The thoracic duct itself begins just beneath the diaphragm in the cisterna chile a sac-like chamber that receives lymph from the lower abdomen, pelvis, and lower limbs by way of the left and right lumbar trunks and the intestinal trunk. Generally, lymph flows away from the tissues to lymph nodes, eventually to either the right lymphatic duct or the larger lymph vessel in the body, the thoracic duct. These vessels drain into the right and left subclavian veins. Respectively, the lymphatic vessels contain valves. When an efferent lymph vessel leaves a lymph node, it may carry lymph to another lymph node by becoming its afferent lymph vessel or unite with other afferent vessels to become a lymph trunk. The lymph trunks drain into the lymph ducts, which in turn return lymph to the blood by emptying into the respective subclavian veins. The thoracic duct is the largest lymphatic vessels in the human body. Around 75% of the lymph from the entire body aside from the right upper limb, right breast, right lung, and right side of the head and neck passes through the thoracic duct. The cells of the immune system circulate through the lymphatic system. The role of the thoracic duct is to transport lymph back into the circulatory system, interstitial fluid, 
is collected by limb capillaries from the interstitial space. Hi again everyone, I'm Jerome Vincent R. Kesson, and in this part of the video, I am going to discuss to you the immune system. We are going to talk about its organization and its cells. Let's begin. The immune system is a collection of barriers, cells, and soluble proteins that interact and communicate with each other in extraordinarily complex ways. The modern model of immune function is organized into three phases, which are based on the timing of their effects. The three temporal phases are the barrier defenses, innate immune response, and the adaptive immune response. So first up is our barrier defenses. Barrier defenses acts instantaneously to prevent pathogenic invasion into the body tissues. This includes our skin, the largest organ of the body, and our mucous membranes that can be found in the mouth, nose, eyelids, trachea or our windpipe and lungs, stomach and intestines, and the ureters, urethra, and the urinary bladder. Next is our innate immune response. This is an immune response that acts fast or rapidly but it is non-specific. It consists of a variety of specialized cells and soluble factors. Here are some its unchanging lines of defense. First is our physical and chemical barriers to pathogens. An example of this is the skin's desiccation or drying out and also its acidity. Other parts of the body that are not protected by the skin uses our mucus membranes and for our eyes it produces tears second producing cytokines and the other chemical factors to recruit immune cells to sites of infection like when you get caught immune cells would go to that site to fight off pathogens and sometimes that would cause inflammatory third it activates the complement cascade or cascade to identify bacteria, activate cells, and to promote clearance of dead cells or antibody complexes. Fourth, it identifies and removes foreign substances present in organs, tissues, the blood and lymph by specialized white blood cells. We will talk about that in the cells of the immune system. And lastly, activation of the adaptive immune system through a process known as antigen presentation. Then our third temporal phase which is the adaptive immune response. This immune response is, is lower but more specific and effective than the innate immune response. It involves many cell types and soluble factors but is primarily controlled by white blood cells or leukocytes known as lymphocytes which help control immune responses this is essential because bacteria and viruses are continually adapting and evolving in an arms race with our immune system here are some features of the adaptive immune system so first up is our recognition of specific non-self antigens during the process of antigen presentation Antigen presentation is a vital immune process. This is when an antigen is presented to a specific cell. For example, is the T cell. Presenting of an antigen is essential for triggering the T cell immune response. Second is the generation of responses tailored to destroy specific pathogens or pathogen infected cells. And last is the development of immunological memory in which each pathogen is remembered by signature antibodies or T-cell receptors. These are memory cells that can be called upon to quickly eliminate a pathogen should subsequent infections occur. Now that we're done discussing the organization of the immune system, 
Let's talk about the cells involved in those organizations. The cells of immune system includes three classes, the phagocytic cells, lymphocytes, and the dendritic cells. The cells of the blood, including all those involved in the immune response, arise in the bone marrow via various differentiation pathways from hematopoietic stem cells. In contrast with embryonic stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells are present throughout adulthood and allow for the continuous differentiation of blood cells to replace those lost to age or function. These cells can be divided into three classes, which I've told you earlier, but first up is the phagocytic cells. Phagocytic cells or phagocytes are a type of white blood cell that use phagocytosis to engulf bacteria, foreign particles, and dying cells to protect the body. They bind to pathogens and internalize them in a phagosome, which acidifies and fuses with lysosomes in order to destroy the contents. Here are some examples of phagocytic cells. Monocytes. So what are monocytes? They're, they are a type of phagocytic cells found in the bloodstream. They circulate around the body, and when a tissue is infected or inflamed, they may leave the bloodstream and enter that specific tissue. Monocytes are phagocytic, but since most infections occur in tissues, it is the ability of monocytes to differentiate that is particularly key. If a particular set of signals are present, it is also possible for monocytes to differentiate into dendritic cells in the tissues. Monocytes are the largest type of phagocytic cells with a kidney bean shaped nucleus when seen under a microscope. Next is macrophages or macrophages. Another type of phagocytic cells is the macrophages that are derived from the monocytes. If monocytes are found in the bloodstream as mentioned earlier, macrophages are found in the tissues itself. They have a major role as a first defense mechanism in phagocytosis of cellular debris, microbes, and any other foreign substances. They also help initiate the adaptive immune response by presenting antigens or antigens to T cells and secreting factors to induce inflammation and recruit other cells. As you can see in the figure 6, Macrophages looks like a tiny octopus for its hair-like arms. They migrate, to, they migrate to and circulate within almost every tissue, patrolling for pathogens or eliminating dead cells. Next is the neutrophils. Neutrophils are a type of white blood cells. In fact, most of the white blood cells that lead the immune system's response are neutrophils. Okay, neutrophils are the most plentiful type, meaning they have the largest number among other phagocytic cells, making up 55 to 70 percent of our white blood cells. Neutrophils are important because, unlike some of the other white blood cells, they aren't limited to a specific area of circulation. They can move freely through the walls of veins and into the tissues of your body to immediately attack all antigens. Neutrophils help fight infection by ingesting microorganisms and releasing enzymes that kill the microorganisms inside. Now to our second class of the cells of immune system are lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are the primary cells of adaptive immune response. The two basic types of lymphocytes are the B cells and T cells. And those two are identical morphologically with a large central nucleus surrounded by a thin layer of cytoplasm. They are distinguished from each other by their surface protein markers as well as by the molecules they secrete. Okay. Let's discuss B cells first. B cells are immune cells that function 
primarily by producing antibodies. An antibody is any of the group of proteins that binds specifically to pathogen-associated molecules known as antigens. An antigen is a chemical structure on the surface of a pathogen that binds to T or B lymphocyte antigen receptors. Once activated by binding to antigen, B cells differentiate into cells that secrete a soluble form of their surface antibodies. These activated B cells are known as plasma cells. Now that I've mentioned it, what are plasma cells? Plasma cells are another type of lymphocyte. A plasma cell is a B cell that has differentiated in response to antigen binding and has thereby gained the ability to secrete soluble antibodies. These cells differ in morphology from standard B and T cells in that they contain a large amount of cytoplasm packed with protein synthesizing machinery known as RAF endoplasmic reticulum. Then now, let's go to our T cells. The T cell, on the other hand, if compared to B cells, it does not secrete antibody but performs a variety of functions in the, attack, in the adaptive immune response. Different T cell types have the ability to either secrete soluble factors that communicate with other cells of the adaptive immune response or destroy cells infected with intracellular pathogens. As you can see on, the, as you can see on figure 9, there is a simple diagram that shows the process of activation of two different types or kinds of T-cell, the helper T-cell and the killer T-cell. To our fourth type of lymphocyte that are important in our innate immune response, the NK cells or natural killer cells. They are circulating on blood that contains cytotoxic or cell-killing granules in its extensive cytoplasm. It shares this mechanism with the cytotoxic T cells of the adaptive immune response. NK cells are among the body's first lines of defense against viruses and certain types of cancer. Now to our very last class of cells of the immune system, the dendritic cells. Dendritic cells or DCs, named for their probing tree-like or dendritic shapes, are responsible for the initiation of adaptive immune responses and hence function as the sentinels of the immune system. DCs are bone marrow-derived leukocytes and are the most potent type of antigen-presenting cells. DCs are specialized to capture and process antigens converting proteins to peptides that are presented on major histocompatibility complex or MHC molecules recognized by our T cells. All DCs are capable of antigen uptake, processing, and presentation to naive T cells and DC subtypes have distinct markers and differ in location, migratory pathways, detailed immunological function, and dependence on infections or inflammatory stimuli for their generation. The diagram shows that the maturation process of dendritic cells, along with its numerous cytoplasmic processes, that makes the linking of innate and adaptive immune response possible. Good day everyone! I am Michelle T. Reyes and for the last part, let's talk about the primary and secondary lymphoid organs and its role in active immune system. When we say lymphoid organs, these are where the lymphocytes mature and increase its number in which enables them to attack pathogens without harming the cells of the body. There are two types of lymphoid organs. These are the primary lymphoid organs and the secondary lymphoid organs. 
Primary lymphoid organs are organs where the immature lymphocytes differentiate into antigen-sensitive lymphocytes. Under primary lymphoid organs, we have two. Number one is the bone marrow. The bone marrow is the main lymphoid organ. It is where all the blood cells, including lymphocytes, are produced. The red bone marrow is a loose collection of cells where the hematopoiesis occurs. While in the yellow bone marrow, it is the site of energy storage which consists largely of the fat cells. Number two is the thymus. The thymus is a bilobe organ. We can find it near the heart and beneath the breastbone. The outer region of this organ is known as the cortex where it contains a large number of thymocytes. The cortex is also a densely packed compared to the rest of the thymus. That's why it stains more compared to others. We also have the medulla. Medulla is where the thymocytes migrate before leaving the thymus. Now, let's move on to the secondary lymphoid organs. Secondary lymphoid organs provide the site for interaction of lymphocytes with the antigens. Under secondary lymphoid organs, we have three. First is the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are small solid structure that is located at different points along the lymphatic system and larger lymph vessels. The function of lymph nodes is to remove debris and pathogens from the lymph in which result to call them as the filters of the lymph. They trap the microorganism or other antigens which get into the lymph and tissue fluid. Under lymph nodes, we have apparent and apparent lymphatic vessels. Apparent lymphatic vessels flow into a lymph node and carry unfiltered lymph fluid, while the apparent lymphatic vessels carry the filtered lymph fluids. Number two is the spleen. The spleen is an organ in the upper left part of the abdomen. Its size may vary in every individual, but it is commonly in 4 inches. The spleen contains lymphocytes and phagocytes. The main role of spleen is to act as the filter of the body by trapping the blood-borne microorganisms. And now, for the last organ under secondary lymphoid organs, we have the lymphoid nodules. Lymphoid nodules is located in the respiratory and digestive tracts. Under lymphoid nodules, we have three. First is the tonsils. Tonsils are lymphoid nodules that can be found along the inner surface of the pharynx. Tonsils is very important because it helps in developing immunity to the oral pathogens. Second is the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue or mouth. We can find the mouth within the lining of the major tracts such as the respiratory, digestive, and orogenital tracts. It is important for the immunity response against the ingested substance. Last is the bronchus-associated lymphoid tissue or BALT. BALT is consists of lymphoid follicular structure. This tissue is also important because it is effective against the inhaled pathogens. And that's it. Those are the primary and secondary lymphoid organs. I hope you understand this topic. Thank you so much.